Welcome back, faithful watchers. In this trying time, where we all wait for the world to restart again, it's important more than ever to have a way to pass the time, be it something to keep yourself busy, keep yourself distracted, or even make a little bit of money on the side while you're locked away from your own businesses or places of employment. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to the models that I painted this May. The first unit that I put a lot of work into, and the biggest accomplishment of May, was this unit of Tully Cavaliers. Going back to the Riverlands, I had a pretty solid formula for the signature blue metallic armor that they wear from the time I did the Sworn Shields, so I focused more on doing a gentle gradient on the large banners and cloth that they wear, the barding on the horses, and the skin of the horses themselves. I think that the brown ones came up particularly well, if the black horse was a little patchy in places. I really love the color on these guys. They wear the blue, white, and red of the resplendent Tully House well. I can't wait to smash this heavy cavalry into a defensive line one day. Hopefully I can play a game soon, maybe before the year's out. Cracking open the Stark Heroes 2 box set, the first model I decided to lay into was Arya Stark herself, the wolf girl. I loved this little thing. Lots of tiny details to keep my attention and I'm particularly proud of how her face came out. That piercing expression and those bushy eyebrows as she glares down the length of needle. The box and card art for Arya Stark seemed to have her wearing some kind of pink or maroon dress, but I decided to go for a more starky gray and grayish blue to keep her in tone with the rest of the army. I'm looking forward to bringing her to the field and all the backup that she can bring with her. After Arya came this batch of cultists from the Cthulhu Death May Die board game. Not much to say here, they're pretty basic with their monochromatic red color scheme and a few metallic details on their hood and robes. The hardest part was deciding how much detail I was going to put into their eyes and faces visible under the hoods, and scribbling down some appropriate eldritch gibberish in those books that two of them are holding. They came out good. I kind of like the simplicity of them. I was able to knock them off really fast to get my totals up for the month. And yes, one of them appears to be possessed with the energy of the Elder Gods vibrating in place along his podium as he rotates around and around. Chalk it up to stiff gears in the turntable. I've had this model of Commissar Severina Rain kicking around forever, and I figured now was as good a time as any to pull her out of my hobby debt box and paint her up. I remember when I originally unwrapped this, I made a vocal noise of disgust when I realized it was made of resin fine cast, but some sanding, filing, gluing, and some green stuff later, and I had something that I could work with. I do really like the design of this model. The typical Catholic space fascist look of the Imperium is slightly toned down to fit the more conservative commissar here. I haven't read the book that she came with. I don't need another Black Library doorstopper on my to-do list. I'm fairly certain it involves shooting a man in the face, then taking command of his platoon and leading them to victory with massive casualties. Just another day in the life of the Imperial Guard. Bits of note were all the gold highlighting on the model, the worn nature of her base that I tried to extrapolate on, and desperately trying to get in underneath the brim of her hat to paint her eyes. It didn't turn out as well as I would have liked, but I think they're still okay. After the Tully Cavaliers, I rewarded myself with a Serio. I love the big, open, flamboyant pose that this model has. The colors were a little basic, but I enjoyed squeezing in a little bit of stark blue-gray to betray his true loyalties. I found his bald head oddly challenging. It's such a big, round, expansive, flat, detailless mush that any kind of change of color or tone would be very obvious and wouldn't really fit. I didn't want to give him a big slap of highlight directly on top of his crown. But I do love how his eyebrows and beard turned out. His eyes, in an attempt to create that over-the-shoulder, cheeky look that he has, ended up looking a little cross-eyed if you see them from a certain angle, but staring at them straight on, I think the effect is pretty decent. Whew, I went back in time for these four. When I was first getting into miniature painting, I decided to paint up all the zombies in the Simon game Zombie Side, a board game that was one of the first I really bought when I was getting into that as a pastime. I knocked off over 30 of these festering little shamblers when I first got into it, then I eventually fell off to paint other things, namely after getting into Warhammer. But now with all this plague in the air, it seems like the perfect time to finally finish off the box. These four have almost got me to the halfway mark, and after that I might paint a few of the character models as a reward for myself. 
I really enjoy making a multicolored zombie horde, so the different flavors of rotting pallid flesh and their shredded clothing helps add to the thought of a giant, shambling mass bearing down on the heroes of the game. Coming into the last models that I painted this month, the Champion of the Faith here was a bit of a proof of concept for the rest of his unit, the Warrior's Sons. The Sons are described as wearing shining silvery armor and a rainbow cloak to represent their devotion to the Faith of the Seven, and the seven colors of the rainbow that acknowledges each aspect of the god. I put a lot of thought into how exactly I'd pull off that rainbow cloak. I've seen a few people do it with a striped pattern, but I thought it would be a bit of a mixed message to have a religious fundamentalist militant organization walking around with a bunch of pride flags on their back. So I decided to go for more of a chromatic gradient on my guys, with the color changing depending on how high or low the areas of the cloak are, kind of topographically. I wanted to see how it would turn out on the champion here, and I think it actually looks pretty good, especially if you take a step back or view him with a few of his compadres. At least one person on Instagram has noted that it looks like a fruit roll-up, but I still like it. The eyes on this guy didn't turn out great, but not everyone can be a winner. And that led to the last models that I painted this May, four more warrior sons. With the pattern and technique of the Champion of the Faith down, I applied to the cloaks of these guys, and it all came out very well. I love the silveriness of their armor, the contrast of the more darker steel of their swords, and that shimmering rainbow behind them. They look super cool in their movement tray. Once I finish up this unit, I'll be sure to show it off. I painted a total of 21 miniatures this month, and I made an effort to diversify what exactly I was putting out. I can't always just be ice and fire. My dipping into older board games and a desire to finish long abandoned projects is making me feel a lot like I have a better handle on all of this. And with the completion of Severina Rain, my box of 40k miniatures has been reduced to what I can only call vaguely manageable? Going into totals, I didn't purchase any new miniatures this month. The lockdown on production has given me little reason to heap even more fuel on the flames as I continue to paint through what I already have. So counting the 21 painted this month, that brings me up to a total of 112 painted, with 119 pending. Still no games played, but hey, that's quarantine, baby. Looking forward to completing the Warrior's Sons and getting some more work on the few other board games that I have. Everybody stay safe out there, and I'll see you in June.